Dr. Lindsay is a retired Navy chaplain and a preacher and a pastor, evangelist, teacher, and has a great ministry all along the lines of the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you, if there's ever a message that our church needs today, it has to do with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And I truly enjoy the ministry this morning, looking forward to what God has tonight. So without anything further, it's all yours. we had this morning as nine or ten people manifested the Holy Spirit that's always a good meeting isn't it yes. amen and we're just delighted to be back again this evening and to see what God will do <laughs> hallelujah now those of you who manifested the Holy Spirit this morning and for the rest of you as well as that the, the enemy has certain one liners he uses on us he may tell you, well, you know, really, you just made that up. It didn't really happen. Well, if you spoke a language you never spoke before, that's something in itself, isn't it? Amen. Yeah. Or he'll tell you, well, that was just you. The answer to that is, that's right, it was me. Then he, he had not got anything else to say after that, if you agree with him. So, the Holy Spirit does not speak in tongues. We speak in tongues. Men and women speak in tongues. That's right. And you have the volition to choose to speak or not to speak at any time unless something's happened that you can't but otherwise if you're in charge of your own spirit you can and Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 I think verse 14 to 15 what is it then I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding of the mind also I will sing with the spirit I will sing with the mind also in the English language when you say I will that denotes determination and choice not just a simple future tense. I will do it. I'm going to do it. I choose to do it. And you have that right. Otherwise, we're dealing with a capricious God. We never know what he'll do. And God doesn't work like that. He has certain plans he goes with, and if we know those, we can work with him. So you might keep that in mind. Put your prayer language in practice daily. Yes. Make it a daily practice. Uh, you pray with the, some things you know to pray for, like you have requests, pray for them. Then go beyond that and pray in the Spirit for those very same things. Hallelujah. Well, we had good results this morning. Uh, I've always felt that if we could communicate, and if we could say what we need to say and people could hear what we've said, real communication takes place, then things happen. Now, any of you who deal with communications, you know communications can be difficult. Simply because we all have different filters on, we hear things differently. Someone said when a speaker speaks, we hear three messages at the same time. One is what the speaker thinks he's telling you. <laughs> Secondly, uh, what you think he's telling you, then what actually is being said. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And so we have to worry with that. Now, I was thinking about this thing of communication. You know, you never know what goes on in the minds of people. Like when you speak to any group, you may be 50 miles down the highway. I don't know where you are unless, you know, unless something happens here. And uh, now, for example, if something would happen of a traumatic nature tonight, you know, something fall in or explode something, I don't know how many people are here, but there would probably be that many ideas of what happened because of, because of what we all think we heard or saw. For example, what goes on in the mind? It is said that toward the end of World War II, one of our American army generals was traveling on a train in southern Germany. And with him was his aide, a bright young second lieutenant. They're riding along. Now, in the same car with them was a very beautiful 18-year-old German girl and her mother. Now, they're riding on quietly. All of a sudden, unannounced, the train entered a tunnel, which meant there was instantaneous and total blackout. Now see the picture, blackout. After being in the blackout for about a few seconds, there was heard the sound of a loud kiss, 
followed by a horrendous slap. <laughs> now, what do you think went on in the minds of those four people as they rode along in the dark? The German mother thought to herself, what nerve. That American lieutenant thinks he can kiss my daughter and get away with it. Good for her, she slapped him. The girl sitting there thought to herself, nice try, he missed, he must have kissed mother. <laughs> no wonder he got slapped. The general sitting over there thought, I don't blame the lieutenant for kissing the girl, but it's a deuce of a note that I have to get slapped for it. <laughs> when what happened was, when the train entered the tunnel, seeing a golden opportunity, the lieutenant kissed the back of his hand and hauled off and slapped the general. <laughs> received your baptism of the Spirit, you should desire to do so. And I think we were able to clear up some misunderstandings this morning. It should be helpful to you. And uh, we'll give you an opportunity again this evening. And of course tonight I'm going to be speaking on the subject of the Holy Spirit in healing. And we'll be praying for the sick tonight. If you're ill or, or injured in any way and desire prayer and healing, then avail yourself of the opportunity. Hallelujah. I'm reading my text tonight. From James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Reading at verse 13, the scriptures declare, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails for much. May God bless this reading of his word to our hearts and minds this evening. I, for one, believe that God wants his people well and whole. Amen. I just believe that. I have a tough time seeing how God has to get somebody sick just to get glory out of it. I don't believe that. I don't accept that at all. Don't misunderstand me. He can get glory out of it if it happens. But I don't think he has to plan it to come about in that way. I think we can bring him more honor and glory when we're well, if we'll be up and about the Father's business, than otherwise. He's not honored when we are sick. Now, you know, some people believe, some people actually believe sickness is sometimes the will of God. Some people believe that. But hear this. If sickness ever is the will of God, then all nurses and doctors are working contrary to the divine will. And I don't believe that at all. I say, thank God there are good doctors and nurses around. We may need them on occasion. Hallelujah. And of course, healing is a work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to be helpful tonight, and I want to be able to encourage faith, and a balance is to be maintained in our thinking, and often patience is needed for healing. Now, most of us, when we're sick or injured, we don't want healing, we want miracle, because we want it right now, you know. And, uh, but healing denotes a process of time in which one recovers. If it happens instantaneously, then it's a miracle. And of course, we welcome both. Now, I think we need to say here, personal sin is not always the cause of all sickness. In time past in our churches, some people used to think, if somebody got sick, uh-huh, he did something, God's going to get them. I don't believe that. Yes. I don't believe that at all. And you don't want to believe it because what are they going to say when you get sick? No. I don't believe that at all. 
There are at least four positions as to the cause of sickness. Now, there might be others, but I think basically this is it. One is sickness can be due to a satanic attack. I think that's true. And I think probably the greatest case on record is that of Job of the Old Testament, in which Satan was allowed to touch Job, take his wealth, take his family, and even bring sickness on, on his own body. And, uh, but God was still in control of the whole thing. He could only go so far. And Job was patient enough to stand with it, and finally he comes out victorious, and God brought him through the whole thing. Now, that can be a cause. Personal sin and disobedience can be a cause of sickness. Can be. The way some of us live, eat, run, it's a wonder some of us aren't more sick than we are once in a while. You know, and uh, personal sin can cause it. So there's been times when we've had people come in our prayer lines who've had infectious diseases due to misconduct. And uh, then if that's the case, then the heart's got to get straight with God too if there's going to be healing, you know. Jesus often said, sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. That's right. So that can be it. Now, probably the greatest cause of sickness is due, the physical effects of sin, is due to the fact that we're here. Yes. We are here. We're part of the human race. And this is what comes upon the human race due to the fall. Yes. And it doesn't seem like we Christians are exempt from a lot of things. No. Because we are here. Now, uh, we have one story, give me, get, talk about uh, one man was healed for the glory of God. If you have your Bibles, let me show you how to read the text here in one occasion. And uh, because I think there's a misunderstanding of the text, and I think it's due to the punctuation that's involved in it. Now, I, bring, I have to bring this to your attention. When the scriptures were originally written, there were no chapter divisions. There, were, there was no paragraphing. There were no punctuation points. Just straight letters, line from line, line from line. Uh, I don't know if you know that or not, but that's true. Mankind has put the chapter divisions, the paragraphing, and the punctuation there to try to help us understand the Scripture or keep it where we read it, you know. I don't think they've always been correct. And punctuation can change doctrinal thinking. For example, in John chapter 9, now this is the way it reads. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man has sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, the night comes, when no man can work. I don't think that punctuation is correct. I don't think God has to have a man born blind to get glory. I don't think he's that hard up for glory. Really. At verse 3, let's read it this way. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man nor his parents. Period. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him, I must work the works of him that sent me. Ah, you get the point? Different thought. Nobody sinned to cause it, but now I must do the work to him that me while it is day. That's a better reading, and I think it uh, gives God more glory when you think of it in that manner. Hallelujah. Now, it becomes evident that the atonement includes the physical healing. This is a dividing thing in our churches today, too. Some people don't think that. The fact of the matter is anything we get from God is due to the atonement of what God did in Christ Jesus on the cross that day. And we see the story in the Old Testament of the bronze serpent. You remember the Jews coming across the desert, going toward the Holy Land? What a complaining and griping group of people that was. They badmouthed Moses all the time. They talked against God. They did wrong things. And uh, uh, so uh, on one occasion, he sent fiery serpents among them, snakes among them, and many of them were bitten, many of them died. Then they cried to Moses, Hey, Mo, Mo, call to God for us, Mo, we're in trouble. We're dying, Mo. And old Moses, the meekest man on the face of the earth, it says, goes to God, and God says, Okay, I'll tell you what. You put a bronze serpent on a pole and stick it up in the sand out there, and you tell those Jews that if anybody gets bitten, take a look at the, at the snake on the pole, and by looking, he will live. 
And so they did that. And if so it was that he got bit, they looked, they were healed. Now, human nature being what it is, I can see some Israeli out there saying, I don't see what good looking at a snake on a pole does. <laughs> you know what the answer is? Well, die then. <laughs> Pretty simple, huh? I guess if you got bit through, you'd take one last look, wouldn't you? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, but there was life in a look, you know. And uh, in other words, there was an act of obedience. Look and live. Hallelujah. Now, if that were all we knew of the story, we would have to say that uh, the atonement has to do with physical healing only. However, Jesus brings it over in the New Testament in John chapter 3 when he's dealing with Cornelius. And then he says to Cornelius, verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So the figure of the brass serpent on the pole in the Old Testament prefigured the atonement, the spiritual atonement in the New Testament, and Jesus brought it over and used it. And of course, it's a figure of himself, which would be lifted up upon the cross. There's life in a look. Now the Hebrew and Greek words for salvation, you know, we use those terms lightly. We think about some soul getting saved. I don't think souls get saved. I think men and women get saved. Hallelujah. Because the, the Greek and the Hebrew words for, for uh, salvation imply the ideas of deliverance, safety, preservation, healing, and soundness. All of that's in that term that we use of salvation. Now, see the reverse of this. The atonement also includes spiritual healing. We have the great chapter in Isaiah 53, you know. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, in all honesty, that is dealing with a spiritual healing. I know people try to make a lot out of it, but that's what it is. I studied the book and uh, in, in the seminary classes, and that's right. <laughs> i never forget. We had a doctor of theology in charge of the class, and he was saying, of course, these doctors of theology get all dried up when they talk. Well, now, you've got to understand that that has to do with spiritual healing only. <laughs> and of course, I'm sitting on the class. I said, well, wait a minute. I said, uh, what about in the New Testament where Jesus went into Peter's house and his mother-in-law was sick and he touched her hand and cast out demons that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. The doctor said, where did you find that? Matthew chapter 8, verse 17. Acts like the people act like they haven't read anything else, you know. And uh, so we see here that what was then a, a spiritual healing in the Old Testament is now brought over as a physical healing in the New Testament. It all comes together here. And Peter said, Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto, live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. It has taken place. Now, just for a little recap, and then we move on. In Numbers 21, we have the story of physical healing, the snake in the, on the pole, look and live. In John 3, we see it brought over to be a physical healing as well. In Isaiah 53, we have the spiritual healing, and brought over in Matthew 8, which shows also a physical healing. It is a prophetic text. Now, it's all in the atonement, really. Now, this does not mean that we're never, ever going to get sick. Some other people say, well, if you really got the faith, you'll never get sick. Wait a minute. If you live long enough, you'll probably get sick again. Likely. Possibly. It may be the thing that takes you. You never know. You out there say amen. Nobody can prophesy what's going to happen to him generally. So who knows, you know. And then there's people who can, in fact, this is a new group in California started to get already. People are, some people are some of the dumbest people you ever saw in their life. <laughs> there's a group down in LA again who got the whole new, a new revelation. If you got the faith, you'll never die. Wait a minute, that's an old one, that's not new. You've had those people all through the years of church history, but they all bit the dust. 
Nobody lived to tell about it. Then if one of them dies, somebody said, well, he didn't have the faith. You better believe he didn't have the faith. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to be dumb, but no use to be stupid, you know. And I'm and, and educated people get into this stuff. It's amazing how it goes, really. And But it is appointed in the man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And honey, nobody's beat the rap but two, I guess. Enoch and uh, Elijah, maybe they beat the rap and... Uh, but the rest of them all went by the grave. We all hope Jesus comes so we don't want to die, you know. And, uh, so <laughs> I'd rather have it that way. But the, <laughs> but the point is we ought to be very realistic about this whole thing. That's all I'm saying. Let's don't be misty-minded about it. Misty-minded. Yeah, that's a pretty good idea. No. Now, we know this healing to be in the atonement. Now. The Lord said in Exodus, now in, in Exodus he gave the curses uh, for the Jews who disobeyed the law. And uh, if you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and will do which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now, in all fairness, we need to understand the text there. This is said in the passive voice. It cannot be said that God does evil. He literally says, I will not permit these diseases to come upon you. The passive voice is what's used here. And this was said against a background of murmuring and complaining. Listen, my friends. Some of us think when people booze and smoke and, you know, uh, carouse around, that's terrible. And it is. But murmuring and complaining may be a worse sin than that because it does have something to do with your own spirit and your mind. Maybe one of the worst sins there is. And we fall into that so easily. We don't like to get it smoked, but we might gripe and murmur and complain, and often we do. And this can bring health problems. Many times our health is bad because we don't think right. Sure it is. If we can get our thinking squared away, we can help ourselves. He says, I'm the Lord that healeth thee. Now, what does God have? Seven covenant names, I think. And in the Old Testament, when you have the name for God, it's not a noun. It's always an active verb. He is the God who does something. In this case, I am the Lord that healeth thee. That's his name. Hallelujah. Now, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. If you take a look at what the curse was, listen to this. In Deuteronomy 28, all manner of sickness and difficulties, pestilence, consumption, fever, inflammation, burning, blight, boil, scab, itch, madness, blindness, confusion of mind. They shall not prosper, shall be oppressed, broken homes, crop failures, loss of property, weakness in body. What a litany of stuff that sin can bring. And foist upon the human, human uh, body, you know. And this was a curse on God's people for failure to keep the law. But thank God. God, Jesus Christ, has taken care of the law and abolished its ordinances and abolished the curses that went with it. Hallelujah. Paul said, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, you know, we're the children of, we're the children of Abraham, we're the children of God, but sometimes we don't act like it. You out there? Sometimes we act we're like we're just as bad off as everybody else in the world. I frankly have an idea that if we live for God and keep our minds straight, we would escape most of these things that comes upon the world. I believe that. But often we let ourselves get into the murmuring and complaining that uh, brings along some of these things. Now, the root causes of conditions of illness may be due to personality. Some people have a negative personality. They've been born crooked and can't get straight. <laughs> they were a minus when they started and they still are. Brings problems, brings health problems as well, you know, can be the cause of sickness. We have a friend, if she's still alive, and I think we're friends, best I know, but in Calvin, Canada. And uh, last time we saw her, she had her hand all bandaged, I mean big bandages all around. I said, Ann, what did you do? She had poured a skillet of scalding grease across her hand. Now, that must hurt. And I began to 
you know, kind of feel sorry, and I realized she was enjoying that pity. Some people just enjoy somebody else telling them how bad they feel because they did this, that. She's always hurting herself. Now, you'd have to know Anne. Nobody likes Anne simply because she's not likable. And, uh, but when she gets hurt, then it's poor Anne. Everybody fawns over her. And that, that's a terrible way to be. That's, that's a sad thing to be in. I can, you know, I can do without friends or anybody else, but of course, still my hands. Yeah. Oh, boy. But she does it, you know. That's her personality. She's a negative personality. And you take the complaining bit. Miriam in the desert. Remember Miriam? Mem Miriam, the Moses' oldest sister. Remember that? Remember when they put Moses in the little basket down on the Nile River there? And uh, the girl Miriam had to stay in white in case somebody got him. And Pharaoh's daughter saw him and got him. And she ran and got his mother to take care of her. That's pretty good. Pharaoh's daughter paid his own mother to take care of him. <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? But now this is Miriam, big sister. She forgot his office. It was only little brother to her. And so now what happened was Moses had married an, uh, a Cushite woman. And Miriam and Aaron didn't like it. And so they badmouthed Moses again. Guys doing all they can to get that bunch out of the desert, you know. Here they're bad mouth and make it tough on him. It's hard. Finally, the Lord came down. He says, the cloud came down. And the Lord says, you people come up here. I want to talk to you. Moses, Aaron, Miriam, and Moses, uh, Aaron. And now we don't know what happened in the cloud, but the cloud was down there. Something happened. Because when the cloud lifted, here's Miriam, leprous white as snow, it says. Now here's old Aaron. Mo, look at Miriam, Mo. She's got leprosy. Mo, do something. Talk to God for her, Mo. And old Moses... Biggest man on the face of the earth talks to God. God said, well, I'll tell you what. If her father spit in her face, you'd have to put her out of the camp for seven days. Put her outside the camp. Let her live with the wild beasts and the snakes for seven days and nights. When she gets to town again, she'll be a good girl. She'll be no more trouble. <laughs> and they did, of course. The camp had, couldn't move till that was over. Boy, when she comes to town, I mean, she's a different woman. Hey, Mo! From now on, it's you and me, Mo. It's you and me. Give me a tambourine, Mo. I'm going with you. Give me two tambourines. It's you and me, Mo, from now on. <laughs> I guess if you lived out like that, it would cure you of a lot of things, wouldn't it? <laughs> Look a snake in the eyes at midnight, that'd be horrendous, you know. <laughs> and so it healed her of her complaining. Now... <clears throat> And then, uh, you know, some people don't want to be healed. Do you ever think of that? Right. Some don't. I've heard people say, everybody, no, everybody doesn't want to be healed. I was in one church one night praying for the sick, and God was moving in a marvelous way. And a man of the church came to me and says, would you come back? Now, we're all up here praying. Would you come back to the back row and pray for my wife? And she had a disease that's going to kill her if she don't get healed. One of those things. And the Lord checked me for a moment. I said, well, why don't you ever come up here where we're praying? Well, no, you go, would you come back? I said, you go ask her if she wants me to. And so as we were working up here, I noticed he go back and leans over and obviously ask her. She was like that. She didn't want prayer, and here she's going to die. I mean, people are funny, aren't they? People do things like that. And so, uh, but you have those kind of people. Then you have the rigid perfectionists whose lives are so rigid, cut and dried, so calculated, even in God's work. Now, we don't have the trouble we used to have. I don't know how it is now, but it used to be in any church, just a handful of people did all the work. <laughs> Why is that? Well, one of two things. Either nobody else will help, or the few don't think anybody else can do it, and so keep it. I don't know which. And then we kill ourselves and then we say, well, they back. No, they didn't. They just burned out. You know. And uh, it can be that some people kill themselves in God's work. And then when they get sick, they wonder, why me, Lord? And we've got to realize that God delights more in his creatures than in their works. And they're worried about the work. And often the case is we serve God and why me, Lord? You know. Let me tell you something. 
I can talk like this because I have the tendency to be a perfectionist. So I know what I'm talking about. My idea is if you're going to do something, do it right and do it now. Isn't that right? Everybody do this. That's right. No. Okay. So I have to say, wait a minute. Sometimes you have to make yourself back off. Sometimes you got to relax a little bit. Some people are so rigid they can't relax, you know. And we've got to take it a little easier than we're doing it. And <clears throat> so then we get sick or something happens to us and we may become angry and anger turns to rage and bitterness. We have a friend over in an, in an adjoining state. The woman is an accomplished pianist, has played in different, different parts of the world with evangelical groups. Her husband got sick and died. And we're visiting her on one occasion. She's telling me about it. Then she said, makes this statement, it seems so unfair. Friends, don't ever accuse God of unfairness. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes, he will. Never accuse God of unfairness. But these hyperactive people, uh, the specialist calls them the type A personality, the workaholics, they're prime candidates for a heart attack. And in this case, the personality is the sickness. One must modify or alter his approach to life. A Jewish heart doctor told his Christian patient, why don't you let God do something you don't have to do at all? Kind of a novel thought, isn't it? Now, I'll give you a real novel idea. You, you may have a hard time with this one. God can get along without you and me. <laughs> he got along before you got on the scene. And he get along when you leave the scene, you know. <laughs> kind of a novel thought. Un unsettling, kind of, but... <laughs> I was in Camp Pendleton, California, serving as Navy chaplain to Marines on one occasion. <clears throat> and one day, the regimental commander, the colonel, passed out in his office. Now, when the colonel passes out, everybody goes into action. The senior medical officer, senior chaplain, doctor, uh, lawyer, everybody's there. Well, it wasn't too bad. The colonel had been to a party the night before. And, and the next day, it got a little hot in his office, and he passed out. Well, of course, they thought he was going to die, and he did too, I guess. But the chaplain told him, now, this is hard on colonels. They're all, colonels are charging. Now, that's how they got there. And they all intended to become a general. I mean, that's what they're working toward. But the chaplain said, Colonel, if you want to live long enough to become a general, you'd better slow down. For the day you die, the Marine Corps will replace you in exactly five minutes. <laughs> you know, we can be replaced. It's a possibility. And uh, some of them don't like to think about that at all. I remember I was a young chaplain down south. Like I say, I was building a church, going to school, working to make a living. I mean, whatever it did to keep bread on the table, I was doing. And uh, things were going pretty good. The church was going pretty good and getting it built. And... One day I got sick. Now, when I get sick, I get sick. I don't get half sick or half well. I'm well or sick, generally. And on this occasion, I got sick and had a temperature of 105 for 30 days. Now, by that time, you don't even care if school keeps anymore. And in my conscious moments, I thought probably the church would go down and probably it could disintegrate. I didn't know. I got up 30 days later, they picked up a few new members doing pretty good. <laughs> That's hard on young preachers. So I figured if God can do it that way, what am I worrying about? You know. So we have to learn these things. Learn to back off the pressure. Back off the frantic emotional pace, the internal pace. Learn to appreciate God's blessings daily. Learn to take time to smell the roses. Learn to cool it. I saw one of those, you know, Gar uh, Garfield the cat. One of those comic strips one day. Garfield has never been noted for having a, a spurt of energy. <laughs> <clears throat> and in the first panel, showed Garfield with a blanket over his head, and he's saying, I've got to slow down. <laughs> he says, I've got to take it easy. Next panel, I've got to take time to smell the roses. And the last panel, somebody bring me a rose. <laughs> <laughs> but if we could live like this, and this doesn't mean you don't have an interest in things, not at all. 
Some things you can do, some things you can't do. Learn what you can do, learn what you can't do. Leave God to bring the rest along. Hallelujah. You'll probably accomplish more this way and you'll win more battles and you'll have more fun doing it. I think church ought to be fun. I think we ought to enjoy what we're doing. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Jehaziel told Jehoshaphat, the battle is not yours, but God's. Now, people with colitis, ulcers, nerves, tensions, heart problems, arthritis, take heed, you may be making your own problems. I made this statement in one of our Los Angeles churches, praying for the sick one night, and uh, a middle-aged lady came forward, head in her hand, sobbing like her heart would break. Someone brought her forward. I took her hands from her eyes and the water just poured out of her eyes. I said, what's the matter, mother? She says, I have colitis. I said, mother, what's worrying you? That's tension. What's, what's your stress? What's your tension? She told me the story, a sordid story. A daughter away from God out in the world of sin, doing what all sinners do. I mean, the worst you can imagine, the girl is in it. I said, Mother, do you talk to her? Yes, I talk to her all the time. Mother, do you pray? Well, yeah, I pray for her all the time. I said, it hasn't done any good, has it? She said, no. I said, why don't you put her in the hands of God and leave her there? Your worrying and your crying isn't going to change a thing. But that's what we do. And I do not, well, I know we have burdens to bear. I do not believe God gives us a burden that should break our, break our health mentally or physically. I do not accept that. There is no temptation or test that is common to man, but which God is able to deliver if we let him do it. Some things you can't handle, put it in the hands of God. And we need to learn that. And uh, we've seen this happen. Peter said, Casting all your care on him, for he careth for you. Well, la-di-da. How many times have you read that? First Peter 5, 7. It, you know, is, and the more you read the Bible like we do, and particularly if you read the King James Version, the words get rounded off, they don't grip you anymore. Have you noticed that? You slide around them. And so the import of that text doesn't seem to grip us. Casting all the care on him, for he careth for you. You know, wait a minute, let's see what it means. That's the true story. Someone asked me one time, are all the stories you tell true? Yeah, they're true. <laughs> there was a pastor over in another state, not one of our pastors, a denominational pastor of the very large church. Had difficulty come along, people, personnel problems. The man got sick. Finally got to where he couldn't eat. Finally went to bed. Looked like he was going to die. Now there was a friend of his who had been a college classmate and then had gone on and become a psychiatrist. Going through the state, he heard about his friend and dipped down to go and see him for a few moments. So he met with him. And finally he said, look, he said, I could help you if I could stay here, but I can't stay. But I'm going to give you one thing that will help you if you can do it. So he told the man, he says, as you lie here, and when your problems come down upon you, just say as loud as you can, let her rip. And he left. Well, the old pastor lay there, and the problem is, let her rip. Several hours later, let her rip. And finally he got to where he could yell, let her rip. And in two months, he was up and completely whole and completely well, back to his job of meeting people. All it's because, I'm going to give you Lindsay's translation, cast your cap up on him, let her rip, for he cares for you. <laughs> give the Lord a hand, you better believe. <laughs> let her rip. Say it with me. Let her rip. Say it again. Let her rip. Say it again. Let her rip. <laughs> our, pro our problem is we're afraid it might rip. <laughs> I was preaching last week in Los Angeles area. 
And Dr. Pam Prickett came to me and says, she's a physician, she said, this is the most therapeutic message I've ever heard. <laughs> Some things you have to leave. Even in accidents, healing is a possibility. If we keep the right attitude for healing and health. And I think the greatest uh, example of this is Miss America of 1980, Cheryl Pruitt, the uh, charismatic Baptist girl. You know the story probably. Uh, had one leg completely smashed in a car wreck. I think she was 9 or 11 years of age. And under doctor's care for the next 9 or 10 years. And by x-ray, weekly x-rays, they watched another bone and shaft grew up around the broken bone. And she's completely healed. Marvelous. She says, I was too young to get better. There you have attitude. You see, things that can happen if we keep our hearts and minds in tune with the Lord. What can I do? Find the struggle points or the stress points in your daily life, then ask God to dilute them or remove them. Learn to appreciate today. Thank people, appreciate friends, family, co-workers. And then read good things that are helpful. For example, to me one of the greatest is where Jesus says in John 14, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Doesn't that do something for you? Sure, to read these kind of things. Hallelujah. Now, oh boy, I don't know how this note got in here, and I've been aiming to take it out, and I haven't taken it out yet. It says, discipline yourself with exercise and have a sensible diet. I don't know where I got that. <laughs> exercise. Diet. Well, you understand that, don't you? We don't need to go over that, do we? <laughs> then realize more people care about you than you know. It's an amazing thing. You may think you're a nobody, but if you die, somebody will cry. That's an amazing thing. I don't understand it, but it is. But don't push yourself to the point to prove it. That's the thing. Hallelujah. And self-pity doesn't help. Don't get into that. Honey, if you get into that, you'll never work out of it. Don't do that. Not at all. Reevaluate your life and your activities. Many people don't have the chance. They just drop dead. Norman Cousins, the editor, previous editor of Christian Review. No. American Review. No, that's not right either. What magazine did he have? Saturday Review, that's it. Had developed collagen's disease. Now, that is a disease of the connective tissues. In other words, that's the glue that holds you together. He was coming unglued. Doctor told him he'd be dead in six months. He said, Well, if that's the case, let me go home. Let me stay in the hospital, pay the bill, let me go home. But he developed the idea that if a person could have a good belly laugh every day, he could bring himself to heal, healing and wholeness. He believed that. And then he believed in massive doses of vitamin C. But he did that. Bought the old Marx Brothers movies, joke books, and all that. In six months, he completely healed himself. Then he wrote a book, cost $13.95, and I bought it. Five years later, he had a heart attack. And the, the wagons came after him, sirens blaring, and he said, stop the sirens, they make me nervous. And they're gonna have immediate surgery. He says, no, whatever brought this on can be reversed. And he completely brought himself to healing again. He wrote another book called 1495, and I bought that one. <laughs> but uh, there are some things we can do to help ourselves if we'll have a little sense with spirituality. That's the point. And prayer avails. And often we must alter our habit patterns to attain and maintain health. And knowledge of the scriptures concerning healing is needed in order to believe God for it, for faith comes by hearing. Now, we're back to the text from which we started. Is any afflicted? That has nothing to do with sickness. That means anybody giving you a problem. You're down on the job, somebody's giving you trouble. That's, what, that's all that means. Personnel problem, that's all that means. And I didn't say form a union and go on a strike. He says, let them pray. Oh, that's a novel idea, isn't it? 
<laughs> how to pray. Praise God. Paul said, pray in the Spirit on all occasions, all kinds of prayers and requests. Then it says, is any merry? That is, are they glad in their heart? Are they happy? He says, let him sing psalms. One reading says, let him sing a song. Do you ever make up your own songs when you sing sometimes? Have you ever done that? Sure, some of mine are better than what they write. <laughs> they don't get published, but... Uh, Paul says in Ephesians 5, making melody in your heart, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. What it does for the heart of a person. How it relieves tension. <clears throat> and when you do that, don't keep it in. Some people say, well, God knows my heart. Well, what a marvelous statement that is. Sure he does. Yeah, that's nothing new. But if you've got a praise in your heart, sing it out. Don't keep it in. There's something about singing and shouting that releases tension. That's why mamas yell at babies. It relieves the tension. <laughs> There's a guy in Arkansas that, that uh, rents his pasture out for 50 cents an hour for anybody who wants to go down there and yell and holler. <laughs> we get so tired that we can hardly talk anymore. Huh? Hey, well, take a big breath. Hallelujah! Glory, glory, glory! Do it with me. Hallelujah. Do it with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ah, oh, you feel better. You look better already. Praise God. It'll do something for you. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's move along here. Is any sick among you? Now, this is an amazing thing. Let him call for the elders of the church, the spiritual guides, the deacons, the board, the preachers, whatever. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. Now, let me say something here. When you call for the elders of the church, you better not have bad-mouthed them. Amen. You might need their prayers. And if you've been bad, it may not work. <laughs> I passed the church one time, and we were doing pretty good, and a uh, pretty good crowd. Well, we had enough people that if anybody missed a Sunday, you hardly knew it, unless somebody come told you, you know. And a lady missed three weeks. She was sick. Nobody said anything. When she gets back to church, she is mad at the preacher. I was sick and you didn't come see me. I said, honey, I'm not psychic and nobody told me. <laughs> what do you think we are, psychics? No. <laughs> Why didn't you call? Somebody had gone if she called. So you have to think about this too, you know. Okay, let them call for the elders of the church. And again, here's another thing. There can be no denial if you're sick. Somebody came somewhere some time ago. I met somebody and I said, uh, well, he said, how you doing? I said, well, you know, I'm not feeling. Hey, oh, oh, don't confess it. Don't confess it. <laughs> Honey, if I'm sick, whether I say it or not, I'm sick. Confessing it don't have anything to do with it. I was going to pray for somebody one time. I said, are you sick? No, 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 no. Well, what are you down here for? <laughs> it's funny how we think, isn't it? <clears throat> no, you have to admit it if you're going to be healed. I have a daughter. In fact, her, my son-in-law is presbyter in Fresno, Bethel Temple. And uh, the only major sickness our family has ever had. My wife and I had ten children. We've had no sickness until she got sick one day. Oh, she's already out of the house, married, all this. Came down with Hodgkin's disease, cancer. And, of course, she went to Loma Linda, which is one of the finest, I suppose. And they told her that due to the fact you don't drink and smoke and booze and you're young, 90% chance of cure. She went through the whole system. Oh, the, the healing is terrible the way they do you over there. And, uh, but she says one day she was lying in bed and a young lady came by who was studying counseling now. It's a university, you know. And the young lady says, my dear, you have cancer, haven't you? My daughter says, but God's going to heal me. Typical Pentecostal, you know. The young lady says, you haven't accepted it, have you? Now, there is something. Honey, you have to accept life as it comes. You can't go through life denying life. As long as you're in denial, there's no healing. But when you accept what comes, yes, I do have it, 
but I'm looking to God to heal me. Glory to God. Well, thank God today she does have a clean bill of health due to God's goodness and medical science as well. Amen. God has brought her through. Hallelujah. Confess your faults one to another. Well, now that's a big one. Your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins, your wrong thinking, your worry, your anxiety, your unforgiving spirit, your grudges, your gossip, your slander, your uncomplaining spirit. My Lord, no end of that. Let me say one thing here. For heaven's sakes, if there's anything to be brought to a healing between any two of you, deal with each other alone. Go to the one you have problem with. Now, if you have something the church needs to hear, then you go to the pastor first and get some guidelines. You out there? Some things don't have to be public. And so you need to be discreet. All right. And we need forgiveness often, don't we? Now, let's move on. Pray one for another. I've always got amazed when I've been pastor of a church. Why is it when somebody gets sick, it's 2.30 in the morning? And I'm half groggy, and they tell me, what, and I didn't want to talk about, you know, I'm groggy. and Got to get up and go pray for them, which, of course, I want to do. But I, I got a better idea. Have them call the deacons. <laughs> Let the deacons deek. <laughs> but wait a minute. Can't we pray one for another? Take the load off. And don't misunderstand me. If someone is severely ill, somebody ought to let the pastor know because he wants to know. He needs to know, of course. But often we could bear one another's burdens if we simply would. When we get our hearts right, quite generally the body may get healed. For there's a close relationship between the mind and the body. The worrier, the nagger, the complainer, the perfectionist are not spiritually minded people at these points. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails for much. The heartfelt continual prayer. Now, we pray for people, some get healed immediately, that is miracle. Some it's due over a process of time, that's healing. Tyson, the Methodist, made a statement, and I think he's right. Some things you have to bathe in prayer, you have to keep in prayer, you have to wash in prayer, you have to hold them in prayer until final an answer comes. Now, we need to learn that. And, but I've seen so many Pentecostal people, I don't get it, well, bless God, it didn't, well, I don't know about that anymore. I, I don't know. And a lot, of we, a lot of times we don't get what we need because we don't understand it. We're to stay in there and look to God. Sure. Really. And uh, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails for much. Learn to forgive your, Learn to forgive others. If you have something against it, learn to forgive. It's hard to get anything from God if you've got something against somebody. And if you need his forgiveness, they need your forgiveness. That's the way the Bible talks, you know. And we have to do that. And then, learn to forgive yourself. Some people can't do that. They'll make a mistake or a slip, then they hold themselves for the rest of their life bonded to something that happened 20 years ago. Get off of it and learn to forgive yourself. I've learned a long time ago, if God forgives my sins, I can certainly forgive them. I like what Paul said in Romans 8, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation! Yeah. Say it with me. No condemnation. Say it again. No condemnation! Thank God. Well, that'll reach if you ever get that in your head, in your heart, you know, do. No country. Now, I got a good one here for you. If you want to make a million dollars, write a book on inner healing. <laughs> you don't have to know anything, just write it. Most of them who write them don't know a minute, don't know it anyway. I was in a church praying for the sick one night. And out of the group that came forward, one young lady, I think a young married lady, I said, what is your difficulty? She says, I need an inner healing. Now, I suppose she thought I would have some magic formula that you said and zap. Go, I don't know. I gathered the group around. I said, I want to teach all of you something tonight. I said, this young lady needs an inner healing. Now, she's all tore up and shook. 
I said to the young lady, I said, somebody's hurt you, haven't they? Yes, she said, she began to cry. I said, they've hurt you deeply, haven't they? Yes, 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 yes. I said, you can't get over it. No, I can't get over it. I said, let me tell you something. You need to forgive somebody for something. Simple. If you're hurting inside it because of what somebody did, you need to forgive that person and get it out of your heart and mind. Whether they're right or wrong has nothing to do with it. Whether they ever get right with God and get saved has nothing to do with it. If you're going to maintain your mental health and your spiritual health, you'll have to forgive them. After a moment, she backed up. I don't know who Jimmy is. She screamed out, Jimmy, I forgive you. And the glory of the Lord came upon her. You have to learn to forgive. Quit holding grudges. It'll kill you. Forgive others. Forgive yourself. That brings inner healing. Hallelujah. Well, my goodness, that's enough, isn't it? Have I said enough? Well, let me say one more. I was in one of our churches, and good healing meeting, and a young man came forward. Oh, well-built young fellow. I mean, he said, can I meet you in the pastor tomorrow? I said, yeah. So we set a time. And he came in. We met, sat on the front row of the church, seat there. He says, uh, he's about 30, 32 years of age. I found out he was the amateur golf champ of that area. He says, uh, can I tell you the story of my life? I said, well, 32 years of age, I can't hear all of it. Just hit the highlights, you know. And, uh, <laughs> come up in a broken home. Really a bad situation all along. And he just had to have a catharsis and tell it out and get it off his chest. All we had to do was listen, which we did. He would cry. He would rub his, rub his eyes and blow his nose, start again, break down and cry. That went on for about an hour. Finally, he straightened up. I said, is that it? He said, that's it. I said, now you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? He said, yes, I do. Baptist young man. God filled him with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you've got to just get stuff off your heart and mind and talk it out with somebody. Get it out. Hallelujah. And God healed him. I want to say one thing here in passing. What happens if we pray for someone and they don't get healed? That worries some people. I like what Dennis Bennett said, the Episcopalian. <clears throat> if someone doesn't get healed, it doesn't mean they're living in sin. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with them. Bennett had the kindest way of saying it. I think he's right. Let's just say they're not open to it yet. Don't blame yourself. Don't blame anybody. Just say, I'm not open to it yet. If you'll stay in there, God will bring you to the place where you can be. Father, I thank you tonight. Let's raise our hand and thank him a moment. Hallelujah. Out loud with me. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God forever and forever. Hallelujah. Bless Father, we pray tonight. Heal our sick, fill believers. In Jesus' name, amen. Are there those yet tonight who have not yet received your baptism of the Spirit, your spiritual prayer language, you'd be interested tonight in having prayer? Could I see a hand? Anybody? Anybody yet? Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else? Honey, this is family. This is one of the tightest families I've seen. Beautiful. Don't be left out. Don't be left behind. How many more? Thank you, son. God bless your heart. In one of our churches, a five-year-old little girl received a baptism. And when I wrote a book on it later, the pastor says she's a radiant senior in high school living for Jesus Christ. How many more? You haven't received yet, but you're interested. Would you raise a hand right quickly? Amen. Those who raised a hand, would you please stand to your feet right quickly? Amen. Now, if you didn't raise a hand, don't be left out. Just stand and join them. Will you please come forward? Come right on. Amen. Praise God. I want three Holy Spirit-filled people to come stand with us. Give me a line right down here. Amen. Praise. Come around. Folks, this is your church. Come on, work with us now. Give me about five people here and five here and five here to be a prayer group right quickly. Amen. This is marvelous, isn't it? You people on the front row look right at me. Look right at me. On the front row look right at me. Honey, I don't want you crying. God loves you. He's going to fail you. Because if you cry, you can't pray. I want you to begin to be thankful. I know you are. 
But let's form the idea of thankful. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray that God would now fill you with the Holy Spirit. And you'll have to understand this is an apostolic way of doing it. When I prayed for you, I want your hands high, your head high, put a smile on your face so God will think you love them. Then I want you to begin to praise God, not in English. Prayer group, get a little closer over here. A little closer over here. I've called the prayer group, or Robert says, to get your prayer language, get with those who are praying in the Spirit, open your mouth and join them. You give voice to it. Raise everybody with your hands up. Hands up. Hands high. Hands high. Hands high. Begin worshiping the English to get your mouth going. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray now you baptize your people in the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Let's begin praying in tongues, everybody. Worshiping. Worshiping. Elders, are the elders of the church here with us? 